and welcome to the Postmodern Art Podcast, the podcast dedicated to giving artists who are wowing the world over the platform they deserve. I'm your host, Nathan Raglan, and for today's episode, well, we look at an animator that has really taken to heart the phrase Carpe Diem and has truly sparked the indie animation scene with his incredible series. Today's guest is Pantastic, a animator, character designer, and illustrator known for his webcomic turned indie animation, Swiss Spark and the Defense Five. Pan is someone that is certainly noticed when it comes to the incredible works of indie animation, especially realizing just kind of the work that he's really put into Swift Spark, mainly the fact that he's doing this basically by himself, aside from a fantastic voice cast, including a uh, very particular person of a very prominent Disney show. We'll definitely discuss that if you guys don't know what exactly we're talking about. But regardless, it leads to a fantastic conversation that I know you're going to love. If you enjoy Pan, please make sure you support him with the links down in the description below, especially checking out Swift Spark and The Defense 5. But if you're checking this when the episode premieres, part two of his pilot should be coming out on Christmas Day. So definitely keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. If you enjoy the podcast, make sure you like, share, subscribe, or follow whatever audio streaming platform you prefer. Leave five stars wherever you can. You know I see that stuff and you know it warms my heart. Another way to truly warm my heart, especially during the holiday season, is checking out the incredible merch shop at fourthwall.com, with the link to that being in the description below. We have a wide range of some incredible designs that I think you would look fantastic in today, and it's a perfect stocking stuffer, though at this point if you order it, it's probably going to be coming after Christmas, but regardless, you'll look fantastic in it. Please get it today. And look, if all you're trying to do is find a nice, cool, casual place to where you can meet other artists and such, really come together as a community and truly grow, maybe you should consider joining our Discord server, the Artist Sanctuary. The group that we have in that server always seems to amaze me with some of the incredible art that they are showcasing, and it truly warms my heart to see just how many people get involved in that server. So I think you'll be a fantastic addition to that community today. But now, without further ado, please enjoy the Postmodern Art Podcast. Just out of general curiosity, how did you hear about the podcast in the first place? Well, you, I believe you followed me on Twitter or the other way around. Probably. Don't exactly remember. (laughs) I also saw the Sir Palo like <laughs> podcast float around at some point. And it was like, hey, <laughs> that one has honestly done a good bit of wonders to me when it comes to introducing me to some cool people. Uh, regardless, so hey, I'm glad that episode went down. But I, I mean, can't imagine. I will say, I mean, obviously, I've heard about you for a good bit because you know, with the indie animation community and stuff like that, and seeing you presenting yourself prominently, it's kind of hard not to miss you out there. So. <laughs> I'm I'm glad to hear that because I I just kind of feel like there's this massive sea of creators and I'm just like I always feel like there's this comic creator named Muyo who kind of his whole shtick is that he he's short <laughs> so he always makes these comics about how people think he's a baby and and then he's like I'm 27 <laughs> and and I just kind of feel like Muyo <laughs> like sitting here like I know exactly all these big creators and then there's me. <laughs> Uh, I was gonna say I know I know exactly the career you're talking about, and honestly, like I I feel that way too. Oddly enough, like on my end or whatnot, I was like I'm trying to to get myself acquainted with some of these like big creators and trying to give them a platform, and yet I'm just here like, hi, how do you know who I am? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pam. Before we really get going, I must ask the icebreaker question of the podcast, if I may. Let's say you get to go to a desert island on your own accord. See, it's just you, alone with your thoughts. You get to kick back, relax, breathe. You get to truly enjoy yourself for a little bit. With accommodations, you're not stranded on this island. It's your own little personal paradise, like a you know vacation house in the middle of nowhere. Um, to help make sure you don't go completely insane on this island, you can bring one piece of media or one piece of art with you to help with whatever kind of headspace you want. If given this opportunity, what would that one piece be? It would be a difficult battle between 
Star Wars Rebels okay. and Phineas and Ferb. Oh, both shows have a main male lead, whom I personally very closely identify with in terms of how their character is written. Okay, like Ezra Bridger is especially in the beginning is a very like he, he's a bit mean and and a bit bit like a nasty little boy so to say and a bit distrustful and as a as a teenager like i did have some troubles at home and at school which did cause me to e easily distrust people or to worry like are they talking about about me behind my back and can i really trust them so that is something in, that I recognize for myself in Ezra. And then later on, he just grows to be this more trusting and really lovable and, and kind of gullible, naive kid, actually, to a degree. And that's also what Phineas is like. And, and usually I describe when I describe myself when I was that age, mm -hmm. like 10 years old, I just say I was like Phineas, except not smart <laughs> like I, I would not be able to build a roller coaster out of toilet sinks and whatever I find on the street but I I was like that open I my parents actively made fun of me of how much I talk <laughs> so that's kind of that, that is the one trait that was like, my brother my brother Compared to me, my brother barely talks, mm -hmm. and I talk oh, all the fucking time. There you go. So it's like <laughs> kind of like Finney is in verb. <laughs> so that was that was a dynamic I I really recognized as a kid and and really loved. Although now that I'm older, I also realize that in in terms of like the distrusting people and anxiety as a teenager, I was Candace. They <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> that's why I'm always. <laughs> I take it personally when people say Candace was one of the villains of the show. Because I'm like, I'm not a villain. <laughs> <laughs> Candace was not the villain. Candace was just concerned somehow. Uh, just like how you're concerned with everything Indeed. going on in life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like... Like my boyfriend is is in in Paris, like nine hours away from me, and he won't respond to my calls at three a.m. He must be he's dumped me. <laughs> he's got someone I, else. I, that 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 I, definitely was me. I my anxiety would have jumped to he's dead, but the dumping one is also very valid. Um, and <laughs> uh, I, I was gonna so, say yeah, when it comes, I, I would oh, have to make. Go on. <laughs> To bring it back to the original question, I would have a really tough time choosing between either Phineas and Ferb or Star Wars Rebels, but I mean, hey, you know, one of those would definitely be. Both of them are very valid. And I was gonna say when it comes to your Phineas point, like obviously you couldn't, you know, make the roller coaster at Kitchen Six stuff like that. You were missing the blowtorch and peanut butter that they needed. All right, um... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but. Regardless, either Phineas and Ferb or Star Wars Rebels. That's your answer. You're locking that in. Yes. Then if that's the case, I cannot think of a better way to start the Postmodern Art Podcast. Welcome, everyone. I am your host, Nathan Ragland. Uh, feel free to like, share, subscribe, or follow whatever audio streaming platform you prefer. Uh, as we get closer to the holiday season, you would look incredible in some brand new merch. Go check out the merch shop in the link in the description below. And follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Blue Sky at Postmod Art Pod, and on uh, TikTok too. I've been using that a lot more. But follow us all there at Postmod Art Pod for future updates and guest announcements, including today's guest. <clears throat> he is an animator, character designer, and illustrator known for his webcomic turned indie animated series Swift Spark and the Defense Five. Welcome to the podcast, Peter Houtman, aka Fantastic. Glad to have, glad to be on. Uh, I'm <laughs> glad to have you. I, well, yeah, I was gonna say I'm glad to have you on as well. I know uh, when you first messaged me, it, it may have seemed a little cryptic, but I was more than happy to the, have you contact me, especially seeing the stuff you've been able to do essentially by yourself more than anything else. Which I know we'll definitely talk a lot about when we really get to the nitty gritty of it. But what you've been able to present with uh, Swift Spark more than anything else has just been absolutely impressive, and I cannot wait to indulge into that. 
But before we talk about the stuff you're doing nowadays, I just want to go back a little bit and learn more or less the origin story of Pan. What got you interested in art and animation in the first place? Well, that goes right back to what we were talking about before, Phineas and Ferb. Okay, okay, it's a good start. And it's it's really complicated because there there was this fan fiction back in 2011 that got really popular in the fandom really fast. So popular, in fact, that the author took it down within like a few months oh, wow. or like a year of it being up. And it was like late 2011 when I found it through a YouTube AMV of all things. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, weird, weird times at the 2010s were weird times. They were, they definitely were. But I, I'd already started like picking up drawing again uh, because I've, I've always like had a thing for drawing, but never like seriously to a, a serious hobby degree. And I'd, I'd already picked it up for a little bit, like redrawing like the covers of these Donald Duck magazines. Like Ooh. we have a weekly release 42 page magazine of Donald Duck comics. And I was redrawing those covers and I came across that video and I was like, what is this? And I was like, haven't I seen these, these guys? And like back then it was, uh, it had just become Disney XD. Okay. And I was like, I recognize this from something. And I started looking it up and I was like, yeah, that's, that's that cartoon. And I started reading the fan fiction and it was like this Lord of the Rings type story with Phineas and Ferb as teenagers. Ooh. And from that fan fiction, the author, Ashley M. M. Simpson, who goes by Gister Ash online, actually got to work on Phineas and Ferb Let's go. as a storyboard artist and character designer. So that was really awesome. And I just, I'm, I'm autistic. So when I find something I resonate with and I enjoy, which was this fan fiction and particularly in the way Phineas was written. <laughs> <laughs> so from the fan fiction, I started watching the cartoon and I believe Summer Belongs to You had recently released and I, I don't remember but I, I do remember that being a recent episode and I just I completely fell in love and, and it just I was like oh my god this this is a career like people actually do this for a living I was like I want to do that well there you go that's a good step and right direction <laughs> especially like the the message in Phineas and Fur because it's like these to 10 year old boys like I was 10 myself back then so I was smack dab in the middle of the target audience I was I was 10 years old myself and I watched these 10 year old boys do like these things that even most adults can't dream of doing and just the whole message of you know age doesn't define you and just go out there and do whatever you feel like doing and don't let anyone of course within reason kids for the love of god don't go and build roller coasters <laughs> in your backyards <laughs> but <laughs> i wonder if if anyone's ever tried to do that at, at like 10 years old i'm, I'm sure but, there's some like kid out there probably with the help of his parents that made like a, a tiny little roller coaster and it was like yeah i'm like phineas and ferb <laughs> Legos. <laughs> Legos, there you go. With your Legos. <laughs> no, I mean, I can honestly see how um, Phineas and Ferb was a good inspiration. Because I know at least, like, growing up, like, Phineas and Ferb was one of, like, the go-to cartoons for me. Like, that was one of the ones that it was always on. So, like, I was more than happy to watch it. Especially with, like you said, like, the message that involved. Just the, the good cast of characters that were involved with it. Like, I'm wondering, like, I know you kind of hinted at it with the icebreaker question. But, like, what was it about Phineas and Ferb that, like, truly resonated with you? Like, was it, like, how you connected with the characters? Was it kind of the message behind it? Just the, the, the art style that presented uh, an amalgamation of all that stuff? Like, what is it about that show that, like, connected to you? Well, of course, the, the art style. Like, I have a really hard time... And as a cartoon fan, I know this is a sin to admit, but I have a hard time getting into a cartoon when I don't like the art style. That's valid. So liking the art style, the big eyes and, and just the, the colored lines, it, it had a very friendly and approachable look to it. 
and then of course yeah the the message like chase your dreams carpe diem mm -hmm. you don't have to build a roller coaster but just find your thing and go for that thing and just believe in it a hundred percent no matter how old you are or who you are and then even like doofenshmirtz is, is kind of like i know he's the villain of the show like officially but i don't consider doofenshmirtz a villain and i haven't in a long time because in, in reality like this is maybe my headcanon and if i ever get to meet dan and swampy i'll just ask like but was doofenshmirtz just in the end a really lonely guy who just wanted approval and just the way he thought to, to get the most approval of the most people at once he just came up with this uh if i take over the tri-state area i'll be the most popular person and everyone will love me because as, as a kid nobody loved me mm. and then at the end you see like as season four especially like his schemes become sillier and sillier and and it's just like Dude, are you just coming up with an excuse to keep the platypus <laughs> coming to your house? Because this is this is not exactly the evilest thing I can imagine, you know. Yo, you you that seems like a very valid head cannon now that you say it out loud. <laughs> it's just, he just in the end he just wanted a friend and, and Perry like Perry was doing it as a job, so so if he stopped being evil, Perry stops coming to his house, so he, you know, he he gotta he's he's gotta keep doing something weird and evil to keep Perry coming. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, so I... that's that's why I'm excited. Like that, I'm not sure if it's really official yet, but from what I've gathered on Dan's Twitter, like Phineas and Ferb's next seasons are going to be about the summer after. So I'm curious to see Ooh. like what they're going to do with Doofenshmirtz because if you remember. Spoilers for Phineas and Ferb, anyone who hasn't watched it, the last episode, Vanessa finally convinces her dad, hey, you're you're not actually evil. And he's like, yeah, you're right, I'm not actually evil. And he, he becomes the school science teacher for like 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if he got fired after technically what happens in Doofenshmirtz 101, but... <laughs> It, his first day did not exactly go well. But so I'm, I'm interested to see like I mean, what's next yeah. for Doofenshmirtz if it's the next summer. I mean, it'll certainly be like knowing the uh, Dan and, and Swampy more than anything else. The creativity they they always have with their cartoons. It's always going to be interesting to to see what they have to present more than anything else. Because like especially like with either Face of Ferb or what they did with um. Uh, what was that one called? Milo, Milo Murphy's Law. Well, both fantastic shows. Um, and also uh, Hamster and Gretel. Like, the creativity that they have with this kind of stuff is always going to be incredible to see. Really brought out to, to full force more than anything else. So I'm sure they'll come up with something creative. I applied to work on this show twice. Both as a storyboard artist and a character designer. Oh, man. But... I'm a European without a degree and not a whole lot of experience, so I was instantly on the bottom of the list, of course, and unfortunately I didn't make it in, but I'm I'm sure you'll get an opportunity someday. I feel I feel confident in saying that. But speaking of opportunities and like careers and jobs and stuff like that, when did for you go from this like general love for art and animation, especially for the likes of Phineas and Ferb, to a passion and wanting to make it your career? Well, when when I was a kid, like I started on TV and Dark when I was ten, got banned twice for being 10. Oh wow. <laughs> and just cas <laughs> casually mentioning it. <laughs> I am Ted. Mm -hmm. You need to be 13 to use this website. Goodbye. <laughs> so this, my third account got to survive to the ripe old age of 22. Been on there for 11 years now. And it, it just started out as well, this, there you this go. hobby. Like, I just having fun with, like, I met my best friend, whom I've been best friends with for almost 12 years now. On DeviantArt, thanks to a a meme, back with the in the old days with the black uh, box around an image with the white text, 
about how mm-hmm. Phineas puts his clothes on every day and like I had the I had like the question he's probably thinking about how he gets his clothes on and then my best friend had the same meme so that's how he puts his clothes on because a shot of the movie actually shows the boys getting dressed in the morning so right. like, we met over that and an 11 year old friendship came from a, a Phineas and Ferb meme. So if if Dan, Swampy, Vincent, if you're watching, <laughs> just know I literally owe my life to you. <laughs> but so gradually you, you go from making fan art and writing fan fiction of shows you really love to being like, yeah, but what if I did this with my own characters? And you kind of start experimenting and at some point i i got into ed's world uh. which was an indie animation cartoon of the olden days mm-hmm. of the new grounds days children gather around <laughs> your grandpa grandpa and grandpa are <laughs> chatting about the past <laughs> but then then i also came across like the kickstarter for a long gone gulch and i was Ooh. like yeah, I I just sat there and I was I was like I was baffled like like people crowdfund these things like like you just you just like hi I want to make a cartoon and people just throw money at you. <laughs> but so I was back then I had just started working on Swiss Spark as a webcomic. Okay. And back then it, this was 2016 and I was working on this webcomic which At first, I was working on an entirely different superhero comic, and Swift Spark in the Defense 5 was supposed to be like a a tiny little bit of that, like a crossover type of just a few pages, like a chapter or two. Then I was like, no, this is actually fun to just do with my own characters, because Swift Spark in the Defense 5 is some sort of an AU alternate universe based on a set of five characters I already had. Okay. But I was like, okay, they're not superheroes in the real universe, but they are superheroes in this alternate universe. Like, what it actually is, is James is writing the comic in universe, so to say. Okay. And I was working on it, and I was like, okay, so I'm going to do this origin story, and then I'm going to do a time skip and then the ending. Like, so the start of how James gets his powers, how he meets his friends, and then the, like, main conflict of the story and the end. And then in between that, there's a two-year time skip, and I'm going to go back after I finish the story, and I'm going to do, like, these Spider-Man and there's Marvel Comics-type issues where it's, like hero and villain of the week because back then i was super into mm, miraculous okay. ladybug a a a very painful love hate relationship <laughs> that slowly died i'm sorry r.i.p adrian <laughs> deserved better but <laughs> but i was super into that and back then it was just kind of like season one was villain of the week type with like a hint at a larger story that was slowly unfolding i was like i want to do that but in comic form and then i in in 2019 i sat down i was like yeah but i I tried to kind of do an animated series with these guys before except i was literally 12 years old and had no idea how to animate and i was like what if so I started retooling the designs to make them more cartoony with that that's where the triangle started coming in. That those tri- the triangle face was definitely not influenced by any other cartoons of any kind. <laughs> yeah, no. What and what other possible it's, it's cartoons face. with a major triangle face? Where where could that original design even come from? Like that's just it's so unique and so quirky. I don't know where you, the influence would even come from. <laughs> We're going to get to it in a bit because it's not relevant now, but I end up, I ended up just laughing at myself so hard. Like, this, this was meant to be like, don't question yeah. it. God, God is, God is, Jesus took the wheel. It's, it's meant hey, to be. Yo. But, 
his, his face gradually got more and more triangular, basically, because I was, like, following this Pixar back then. I'm not sure if it's still up, but, like, Pixar in a Box website that had, like, tips on character design. And basically, that's how he ended up being shaped. Like, he is, like, he could, like, cut you open just by looking at you <laughs> <laughs> he's squishy i promise he, he's actually really squishy and in 2020 i was like okay i'm going to actually animate this and so i ended up animating a minute which that same minute is what ended up in very differently looking and very retooled and very much improved in the actual pilot okay and i tried to do a kickstarter and of course you, you i had like a couple thousand subscribers i had like twelve thousand, so i have more than i have now but then i was like i'm going to stop making fan art and i'm going to do my original thing and most of my subscribers were like no, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I lost a thousand subscribers. Oh. It's it's starting to grow again, but you know, YouTube also gets confused. YouTube's algorithm also goes like, no. no. <laughs> but suddenly you start making videos that aren't as interesting. And I could really tell as long as my channel was in the red, in terms of subscribers, it got barely promoted in the algorithm. And as soon as this year my channel got into green in terms of subscribers, in terms of subscribers again the promotion on youtube's and also kicked in more again so it's i'm starting to finally see growth again after three years and a few years later in 2021 i believe or 2022 2022 i tried to do another kickstarter which also did not succeed but i was like okay by now i have 2000 Euros saved up. I can get some voice actors and I can storyboard this thing. I had already storyboarded it by myself with just hours and hours of tutorials from professional storyboard artists and just learning how to do it myself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what if I just tried? What, what if I just tried Phineas and Furbing this thing and animating it myself? There you go. And well, yeah, I. I at first thought like, okay, this is going to take me two, three, four years to do by myself. And then I actually started to properly learn how to animate. So properly storyboarding and everything. And I just got so much faster. Like I have a Star Wars animation on my channel. That is one of those really popular animations that got me that boom and subscribers okay that took me three months to make and it's a minute and a half long where i made swiss spark the pilot just by clever reuse of animation and not like it's it's really basic it's basically just sitting and talking for an episode with like implied action more or less like it's it's really simple and that that's how i was able to animate 22 minutes by just doing the kiss method like keep it simple stupid yep or keep it stupid simple it's either or <laughs> so i i <laughs> i look back at that and I'm like you made such a massive jump in skill in just a year yes. and, and that's wild so i in the end even if it's not like professional level yet i'm for someone who just decided to fuck it i'll do it myself <laughs> that is a great mentality to have i'm it's, pretty impressed with myself. oh no you should be impressed with yourself that is a great mentality to have that's a mentality i've kind of had whenever i created this podcast in the first place like i've always been a person that loves like the the behind the scenes stuff when it comes to, to like cartoons and art and animation but like Re recognizing that out there there wasn't like enough people really giving that love and support to people so i said and i quote fuck it i'll do it myself and i made i created my own little platform for artists such as yourself doing incredible stuff out there and i mean like obviously the greatest example of that from what we've been talking about is this incredible concept that you have established right now swift spark and the defense five which is absolutely insane and outstanding 
because whenever I initially heard about Swiss Park, I just thought, oh, this is a you know kind of cool idea, probably like a little one-off thing that this person wanted to do. But no, this is something that is like rooted in like years of of love and and uh, appreciation more than anything else. That I've especially noticed the more I kind of delve deep into this. I know you kind of establish like how it originally came to be, it being an AU of a of another comic that you did. But how did the initial concept for Swift Spark come in the first place? Like, what made you initially want to bring this story to reality? Well, since I've been since I was five years old, I've been like obsessed. With Spider Man. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, I am wearing a Swiss Bark sweater. There you go. <laughs> and underneath, if I can get it to fold up, I'm wearing a Spider Man <laughs> t shirt. So it's, <laughs> it's like I, I've just been obsessed with Spider Man and all three versions of Spider Man. I, I've never been a hater of either three. Although. I was a teenager, so I was finally old enough to go see them in cinemas by the time Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man came out. So those are special to me because those are the first ones I saw in cinemas. Fair. But so I, I've always just been like hovering around that concept of this superhero who's not really good at being a superhero, but, you know, he still tries to be a superhero. Mm -hmm. And... The Miraculous Ladybug and Ava's Demon was a, a webcomic I read back in 2012 that I was enamored with, the, the art style. If you don't know it, look it up because it's beautiful. Okay. And it's still going, like, after a decade. And it was several, like, 2,000 pages in by the time I found it in 2012, so it had already been going for years. And I was like, I want to do this, too. And so I'd, I'd already done, like, a Phineas and Ferb fan comic. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> and I was no. Like, okay, now I, <laughs> I want to do it myself. And so I started writing this story. And James's father in the other universe is dead. Mm. And I was like, okay, but what if he just kind of wrote this story where his, his dad's actually alive or actually he, he believes his dad is alive and he goes look for him and you know it's also kind of like that wish fulfillment from James's part and I was like okay what if we we made it superheroes and and miraculous ladybug was a, a leading thread in doing the superhero version and it, it just kind of snowballed from there I mean, I think that's honestly incredible thinking about, like, the because that's a, a concept I didn't even realize as I was doing my little research, kind of the realizing that this is actually a different person writing their own interpretation of, like, what they would want to see themselves as with this, like, cool superhero thing with their dad still being alive, just captured and locked away, and it's up to, to James to be the hero to try to save his father. Like, that is a really interesting concept that, honestly, a as you go forward with the animation, I'd love to see how you can find a way to, like, weave that into the narrative. Just kind of, like... The, the, the real life James like being the storyteller being the, the the true narrator instead of just like you know a superhero story like that that's just me personally like just talking out loud but regardless like you know seeing what you've been able to the the years of dedication you've had with Swift Spark that's another thing that I've got to like uh commend more than anything else but before we do go on i think it's probably best for those who may not have heard of swift spark before clicking on this episode how would you best describe swift spark and the defense five swift spark in the defense five is about a teenage boy who discovers one day when he's cornered by a bully that he has superpowers and that bully also has superpowers oh that's weird Interesting. And he he ends up discovering that his father also had superpowers and that his father actually disappeared on a very mysterious night under very mysterious circumstances. And he's like, Okay, I I have to do I have to go find my dad. He wrote this letter to me explaining how I got my powers and obviously he wants me to come find him. No, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> but 
by more maybe more on that later i don't know it's it's kind of spoilers mm. so maybe we won't discuss it but he just decides okay i'm going to take my dad's suit i'm going to take my dad's name and i'm going to make them mine and i'm i'm going to step in where my dad went missing and i'm going to take down the guys that took down my dad and the guy that is the son of the guy that took down his dad also wants him because both their fathers disappeared on the same day mm. and so they're like hmm yeah. Daniel the villain is like you made my dad disappear or at least your dad and James is like no you made my dad disappear so it's kind of their dynamic is kind of nah uh fuck you mean now <laughs> no i was gonna say their their <laughs> dynamic is is literally the spider-man meme of the two spider-mans pointing at each other that's literally their their, their yeah. dynamic <laughs> kind of like that <laughs> but he's a little he's a little over eager overestimating himself and he's a little rambunctious and and he can't really control his powers all that well in the beginning so he, he's, he's kind of like i was watching kid cosmic a few days ago because i i have a friend who keeps telling me to go watch kid, kid cosmic and so i did hi evan yeah, I, was, I, I watched kid cosmic i was literally, I was, I, I was, I was, I was literally about was to like, say i was literally just about to say I, let me guess it was star tease that recommended you watch kid cosmic wasn't it <laughs> i was watching and i was like fuck <laughs> kid cosmic is, is so much like james but a little bit younger like so it's just a little bit more helpless than James. James knows his way around at least a little bit. And then Kid, especially in the first few episodes, is, is really, like, just really sad. <laughs> but I was like, hmm, maybe people are going to find another thing to call out similarities between. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, because it reminded me... No, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I gotta say, like, it's really impressive that, like, it's a really interesting story. It's a really interesting dynamic, just kind of understanding like a person's motives and like how that can really drive a person in so many different directions with Swift. It's, you know, taking up the mantle of his father and trying to be the hero with like the, the main antagonist. It's taking up, it also take up his father's mantle, but like intent on, you know, destroying the world and figuring all, all, you know, for a main common goal. I mean, it's really interesting. And I mean, especially looking at the web comic that you've had for years, which is the thing that again, really surprised me as I did my research. I did not realize how devoted you've, how much time you have devoted to this story. I mean, it's gotta be insane, especially thinking about it now, here we are close to the end of 2023 and you've had this web comic, like at least initially started and maybe redone, but since what, 2017, like it's gotta blow your mind how far you've been able to develop this story. Yeah, at first, I, I really wasn't expecting it to go this far. I mean, I can only imagine. Like, was there a reason why you started this off as a webcomic? Like, was it just, like, the convenience of it? Like, I didn't know how quickly you wanted to jump to this being animated or not. So was it just kind of, uh, like, you you had mentioned that you were influenced by another webcomic. Was it just looking at that and thinking, I can do it similar like that? Like, why start off with the webcomic? Well, as I did explain, I just came off a Phineas and Ferb comic, which was a comic version of a fan fiction I'd written, okay. which was just this, this concept I'd been obsessed with since the movie came out. And Doofenshmirtz at the the final scene on top of the D, DE Inc. building, he's like, mm -hmm. what if, you know, I capture you and turn you into a boy bork? The J. <laughs> 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 the Phineas, not James. <laughs> I'm not saying I see the connection, but. <laughs> There's a reason for that. Uh, There's uh, a very uh, good reason we'll, for that. And we'll, we'll get to we'll, that. We'll talk to that. Right? In a, we'll talk about it in a second. Trust me. That's something I definitely pegged as I, as I did more research. But go on. <laughs> Doofenshmirtz says to Phineas, now the ball is on the other foot, and I'll have a brand new platyborg, and maybe even a boyborg. And then repeat that five times fast, so it's not actually that difficult. And 
Perry saves him, saves Phineas by throwing him a baseball bat. So, of course, we never got to see what that would look like. Although, Dan and Swampy did end up kind of turning it into a little in-joke by making Other Dimension Ferb a boy bork in a later episode, which went back to the second dimension. So it was like, hey, remember this? Yep. But I, my little 11 year old mind back then was like, oh my God, what if, what if that was, what if that actually happened? And so I, I ended up writing a fan fiction, of course, right around the time when someone who was way better at art and writing than me <laughs> did the same thing. But I was like, ah, I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just going to keep going with my own thing. And I ended up doing it in comic form and I was like, okay, so... I can do that. I, I can make a comic. And I was also like, like what, how would I tell this Swift Spark story? What would I make another comic or would I write it? Because back then I was, I was writing a lot of fan fiction. I was like, what, what if I just wrote it? And it's like, no, it's, it's like an action thing. I, I want to see, I want to see the action, the cool action stuff. And I was like, right. I, I'd never really done an action comic before. So it was like, there was a little bit of action in that if things went differently is what it was called. You're not going to find it because I took it down off of DeviantArt a few years back. But it was my first step into action and actually doing visual action. I was like, I want to do more of that. And so that's how I ended up doing Swiss Park as a webcomic instead of written or any other medium. I also knew that I was never going to be able to animate it by myself mm. back then. No, I was going to say. I thought <laughs> it was never. <laughs> you underestimate my power. <laughs> I was really like about to say, hmm, my, how the turns have tabled. <laughs> but yeah, so at first I intended to just do what I could with the skills that I had because at the end of the day that that's also something I sometimes I get emails from people like how did you how did you start this I want to do it too and, and do you really do it by yourself and how did you do that like and and sometimes it kind of devolves into this conversation like I can't get people to work for me on a volunteer basis and I'm like I mean I don't completely believe like of course animation it in the end it, if you can you should pay that's yes i i can pay so I, I do pay what what i can and what i can't pay i do myself it doesn't mean i'm completely opposed to volunteer work but i also believe that you need to have a solid concept if you're going to work with others and you're you need to have certain leadership skills like if if you're not ready for that yet don't do a whole animated series like you can also do like little 30 second shorts or a comic or even you know just write just write a script or just write a story and it's important that you just work with the skills you have to just create something anything and then build that outward as you build your skills and you build your team and you get better at leading a team and leading yourself too because even doing it yourself it, it's a whole task of keeping stock of things you still need to do and you have done and shop lists and all that if you can't do that on your own then you you can't really expect you'll be able to do it together with others so it, it's basically just that's why i started with a comic do what you can with the skills you have and then look into expanding or improving it later. I need to put my glass down because my hands are <laughs> too lazy. Uh, no, trust me, I get that mentality sometimes. No, I mean that that is extremely fair and valid. How you kind of illustrated that more than anything else. I mean that that's something that I imagine a lot of people, especially as they see indie animation more or less taking off. Like some people are really ambitious and want to jump to go ahead and starting this stuff, but also realizing that you need to start first. You need to have a good foundation before you can go forth and make something happen. And believe me when I say when what you're developing with Swift Spark, there's a great foundation for what you've had there. Like I said, years of a web comic behind it, several interesting uh like 
stories and moments throughout the entire run or whatnot. I'm genuinely curious, at least on your end, when it comes to the webcomic, is there a particular moment or a particular sequence that you are personally proud of? Like, looking back throughout the entire run, you're thinking to yourself, wow, I can't believe I was able to bring that to reality. Well, with the webcomic, it's not necessarily, like, specific scenes okay. that I'm proud of, but just the, it's, well, maybe the, the pilot version of the, the pilot comic, like, I'm, I'm also on the side doing a comic version of the pilot, and that, of course, it's kind of cheating because it's the backgrounds <laughs> from the pilot, but I'm, I'm proud of, of that idea, though, because I was always, like, team, I can't draw backgrounds mm. until you can't or you won't. <laughs> so I started practicing doing backgrounds. And it's like, look, you actually can do backgrounds. I, I love how you called yourself out right there, so like, more than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's, like, it's, it's over 800 pages by now yeah. the comic. like if you put everything together and it's 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 massive and not only did i do 800 pages i went back twice three times actually to redo pages and it's just like seeing the growth from the very first version to now and it's like you know that that's five six seven years like that growth is massive is insane so it, it's more the accomplishment as a whole rather than specific scenes where I'm like, damn, you did that by yourself. I mean, that's that's honestly a, a really valid way to assess it more than anything else. Like just just realizing like from where you had started back whenever you were initially just making comics of, of Phineas and Ferb and, you know, getting influence from stuff like that to the point to where you are now to where you have this like really invested lore and this incredible universe and incredible characters on top of that in a span of, you know, what doesn't seem long, but a good chunk of, you know, a person's life regardless, especially your own life to the point to where obviously it evolved from that web comic to becoming this incredible, independent, self-made, animated pilot. Now, at what point during the Swift Spark run did you decide, or at least what influenced you to be like, you know, webcomics are cool, but I want to see this thing animated. What made you want to take this into the animated front? The realization that there was a market for indie animated series. Like, Ed's World was just a group of friends just making the, the best they could like whilst having fun i i had no idea that it became like so huge with with so much money behind it later yes. on yes <laughs> like that that all came when i actually started researching in the animation itself to me it was was just a group of friends doing fun stuff in in their you know in their own bedrooms i, I had no idea it was actually that huge yeah. And then you know, Long Gone Gulch, and in 2019, Has Been Hotel, and everything that came after that, that actually, it, it got picked up. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's it's wild. And I was like, you know, this webcomic is fun, and I'm, I'm going to get to that point where it's done, and there's that time skip. But instead of doing, like individual issues with like short 40 page stories maybe what if i i looked at it from a different perspective and put it in the context of a miraculous ladybug or the spider-man cartoon ultimate spider-man that was still airing back then and of course Phineas and ferb and i just looked at it and i was like and steven universe was also something i was big into back then i was like what if i did this what what if i went and actually tried to make it animated and well it took four years but it ended up happening yep yep at least yep. because i think that the the plot and the structure for what was originally going to be those that span of like short comic issues 
lended itself really well to a cartoon, which was proven by cartoons like Miraculous Ladybug and Ultimate Spider-Man and Avengers Assembled and Hulk and the Agents of Smash, all those cartoons that I was watching at that time that were specifically about superheroes. And I was like, I, I have something similar here. I, I can do that. And I did. I mean, uh, you you certainly did. I'll, I'll give you that more than anything else. And it's at least when it comes to the animation front, the fact that you did it all by yourself is a thing that I cannot help but commend more than anything else. I've had a good couple of creators that have gone forth and created their own animations. I mean, recently for the recent Indie Animation Day, I brought on uh, Wizzy MMD70, who initially did Bob's World at 14 all by himself. So, I mean... It, it's always something that I always commend more than anything else, but I'm just also genuinely curious. Like, why did you go forth and make this animated pilot all by yourself? Like, was it just a matter of you weren't sure if you could compensate others properly, or was it one of those you wanted to test yourself to see if you could even do it? Well, the Kickstarter, the second Kickstarter, ended up with a lot more money than the first one. So I did see growth there. And I did see, like, people were starting to come from other websites, if mainly Twitter. And I was like, people are showing interest, and people want to see this become a thing, and what if, you know, you know, I was at first like, without this Kickstarter, I can't do it. What if I just, for once, did a Phineas? What if I stopped telling myself I can't, and I just told myself, I believe I can, and that's the measure, the measure of a man. <laughs> yep, yep, more than anything else, I mean, you cer and you certainly put that measure out there more than anything else, and, you know, it's one thing to compare yourself to Phineas, it's a completely other thing to just grab Phineas as well, and to just bring him on board. <laughs> I... How, how did you convince It wasn't intentional. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's talk about that because I've been wanting to ask about this. How did you convince uh, Vincent Martella, the voice of Phineas, to come on board and voice your main character, James Riverdale? I was convinced he was two messages away from hitting the block button. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> I just, I love him so much. Like, Vincent, if you're watching, I love you. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, you're you're amazing, and I can't believe that I got to work with you, and we are going to get to work together again very soon, as soon as sag approves the next episode. But 2021, around the summer of 2021, I was starting to really gear up Swiss work, like, I'd already come off of one Kickstarter that didn't succeed and I was just slowing things down and I was going like, okay, I'm just going to make a more solid concept first and like really figure out what I want to do. And so I just DM'd him and it was like, back then I DM'd him for like a background role, like maybe a minor villain or, you know, something like that. Like he, he is an actor I really look up to and he, he is like, the voice of a character I have considered a friend for a decade. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny to hear the, the character say that he considers me a friend too. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's between me and Vincent. It's really cute. But it was like, you know, just this guy, this, this guy has been the center of all of this w without even knowing it. This is so parasocial. This is, <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, maybe I can convince him to work with me for like a 30 second or a, a two second or however short cameo. And I think I, I'm not sure if I watched a friend play or someone on YouTube, but I, I watched someone play Final Fantasy mm -hmm. and hope Final Fantasy thirteen, I believe, in Hope S time. It, it was a scene where Hope is arguing with Lightning, 
and I heard that and I went, holy shit, that's <laughs> that's James. That is the voice. Like at first I was like, I was toying with the idea of voices. Like at one point I named Dipper and it wasn't quite it because Dipper's voice was too mm -hmm. low. And like Varian from Tangled, Ezra, Ez Taylor Gray, Ezra Bridger, and like Max Goof, even from from a goofy movie, but maybe that's also just because the like the character is, is similarly written. But so those were like voice references I was kind of toying with, and like, but it all wasn't quite perfect, you know. And I had a couple of friends who voiced James in earlier versions of the teaser, and it, it just it was close, but not quite. It. And then I heard Hope. In Final Fantasy, and it just it clicked, and I immediately knew who was voicing him, and I I looked I looked it up, and I was right, and it was Vincent. <laughs> and then the other DM came like, "Do you? I I actually really want you to play the main character," and I I don't know like I I felt like I was being messed with. <laughs> because he wouldn't reply but then he would tweet like i want to voice more characters in cartoons and i was like i have a character in a cartoon just for you <laughs> <laughs> i'm right here it's like you know it, it kind of felt like that meme like i wish there i wish i could find a guy like him like i'm a guy like <laughs> I'm I'm the guy I'm literally the guy in yep. the picture. <laughs> I was like I'm literally the guy in the picture, and eventually, like, I kept I kept literally I I will say pestering <laughs> like four five six times. I just repeated myself like I'm serious about this. I'm not joking, <laughs> and then he finally responded and was like, "Hey, this is my agent." And you'll have to talk to them. And thank you for considering me. And I was like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that face you just made right there just said it all. Just like, yes. <laughs> and so I emailed this agent. Mm -hmm. And then his agent was like, hi, is this is this SAG after approved? And I was like, it's, it's what <laughs> and And so... So then I had to go to SAG after. I was like, I'm not, I'm not gonna let this go. This, this is the guy. This is 100. That there's no one else. No one else can voice him. It's, it's, it's perfect. I'm going to do whatever I need. I'm going to move mountains. I am going to Phineas and Ferb this shit. <laughs> and like, my friends were either hyping me up or going, nah. You know, being like Buford. <laughs> <laughs> Buford and Summer belongs to you. Like, I, I had a group of friends that were hyping me up, like, yes, go, go for it. And then a group that was like, nah, he's never, he's never going to do it. He's never going to do it. And I was like, bitch, he did it. Yep. I did it. Yep. <laughs> and he was so wonderful to work with. Just amazing. And, and his friend, David, who plays Ferb, on Phineas and Ferb's newest season mm -hmm. and in Milo Murphy's Law and he's done some pretty awesome other characters such as I haven't watched it because it's not available in my country but I believe Porky Pig's like kid version in Looney Tunes like Tiny Tunes Looney Oh okay yeah, I know what you're it's talking probably about. not Porky Pig but because it's not the Looney Tunes, but like their kids or something. No, yeah, it's it's, I, 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 it's not on my version of HBO Max, so I can't watch it. But <laughs> that's why you need to get a VPN, which reminds me, this though. podcast is sponsored. No, it's not sponsored by a VPN thing yet. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. Again, not yet. But Advertisers, I'm listening. Anyway, because we still have, we have the HBO Max still, and you guys have Max. I tried um, because I used to be able with my old VPN that I ended up stopping because it doesn't work on Disney Plus and Netflix has too much stuff that is already right, available right. on mine as well. And we still have HBO Max and you guys have yeah. Max, which is a different domain name, so I can't sign in with my account on Max.com. That's, that's, that's weird. Anyways. Too bad. <laughs> 
But to bring it back there, he was like, he voiced those characters and he lended his booth, his voice acting booth out to Vincent for the episode. Aww. And so it, it was really cute because I posted the casting call for the second half of the pilot because I ended up deciding to produce it in two mm -hmm. halves, both for me, the financial burden was a little bit less because I wasn't making as much money as I am now. I'm now making enough to survive off of. And whilst I'm only paying a little bit of rent here, it's enough to keep the production at least partially right. going. But back then I was making a couple hundred bucks a month. So I just first pay for the first half and then pay for a second half. And I put that casting call out there. And I, I got a DM, and, and he's just like, I'm a voice actor, and I have a booth. And I was like, no way. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I get Phineas, and I get Ferb. It's, it's, it's true. <laughs> when you get Phineas, you get Ferb. It's, it's, you cannot only Phineas or only Ferb. It's Phineas and Ferb together, both not separate. <laughs> and I just, I was like, no way. And so I just... I ended up going through the auditions as I, I just put them in there under a different name and I just listened to them blindly and I landed on him and I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, now, now all we're missing is for you. I, I promise <laughs> I was honest, but he was perfect. Now all we're just missing is for you to get uh, Dan Povenmire to, to voice like some like background doofus first ass Honestly? character and there you go. <laughs> Honestly, like, <laughs> I did, I want to, like, because I've, I've seen Dan and Swampy do, like, podcasts before, and it's like, maybe, maybe they would be up for a little interview, like, not necessarily an interview, but, like, a private meeting where we just talk about pitching and how, because Finney has and Ferb took 13 years to get picked up, and I was like, maybe I can get some insights from them to starting my own pitching journey, and they ended up not responding, but Vincent did let me know in, in like a very <laughs> between the lines way that they read my email. Aww. And now I'm mortified because <laughs> they know I exist now. <laughs> like, and you, you won't let me know what you think about it. So, of course, my brain is going, but they hated it. They think it's awful. <laughs> and they never want to hear from me again. But I was writing for the latest episode and I just, the design, everything, I can't get. Doofenshmirtz's voice out of my head from writing this character. I was like, no, you're going to have to get it out of your head because you're not going to get Dan Povenmire to, to voice the character. You're, you're, it's, it's like, I mean, I, I could try, but I, I honestly think he's, he's too busy to do it. So it's, that it would be fun. But I think that's a little beyond my reach. That's that's fair, but also I'm just now imagining Ah, Swift Spark! Your arrival is completely unexpected. And by that I mean completely expected <laughs> Honestly that 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 is the vibe the character has. <laughs> and he, he's like a The thing is, like right now he's just like a a brief intermission in the episode of sorts like he's not the main main villain but he does have another episode planned later there we on go. where he comes back so it's like eh. that's fair that's we'll see if vincent and david watch this and they're like <laughs> 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 yeah it's like but, re re regard <laughs> they said this to dan <laughs> I'm going to crawl under a table and die if I ever get a message from Dan. Like, I heard you were looking for me. I, I feel... Uh, I send you an email once and you didn't <laughs> reply. I'm good. I'm, I'm not doing that again. I, I feel like it's just a matter of time. Like, seeing how interactive Dan can be online, it has to be just like a matter of time before he finds some way to interact with you. But, I mean, regardless whether or not you're able to get Dan, like, not just, like, Vincent on the initial cast, but the cast you've been able to build up with all these unique characters. Like, you've really developed, like, an, an incredible eclectic group of characters uh, through the Defense 5 and such, um, with all the different things, like, it, it has to amaze you more or less, like, how 
unique of an experience as this to really put this thing together like getting the incredible people you had to help you out but also like what you've been able to produce on your own the fact you were able to produce essentially like close to 30 minutes of animation on your own yeah it's i as i said before it's like i thought it was going to take me years and i was actually like working on a shot and i was like how long have i been working on this and it's like Four months and I'm almost done. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> time is so just a flat circle. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and I ended up just animating the whole thing. Like, I did take a a brief break in between for personal reasons. But after I took that break, I, not counting the break itself, I ended up animating the whole thing in like ten months. There you go. So that was it was absolutely wild. Like, and now I'm I'm working on multiple episodes, and there there is a character because I just when I seek someone out, I seek them out because I've been personally inspired by their work, mm -hmm. and this is someone who has I believe only one voice acting role, but he has several acting roles, oh. including a soon director role, and if I pull it off to work with him, I've been a fan of this guy since I was, again, like, 11 years old. <laughs> we didn't have internet until, like, 2008 in my household, so I didn't have a lot of internet experience as okay. a kid. And starting, starting in 2011, I... I was finally kind of let loose on the internet by my parents. Like in 2012, I got my first, com my own computer and everything. So <laughs> that's when the ball really started rolling. But it's, I'm not going to say who it is yet, just in case it ends up falling through because he's the world's busiest man. Even his agents can't <laughs> seem to get along. <laughs> but it's someone who was supposed to appear in the Five Nights at Freddy's movie, and he was too busy to make that work, too. So. Oh, are you kidding? Oh, my... No, uh, okay. If you if you can pull that off, I will be impressed, because I know exactly who you're implying. And if you can make that happen, I will be seriously impressed. He has been my favorite <laughs> since... SpongeBob Slendy, <laughs> and that's a while ago. <laughs> so fingers crossed at this point. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, and the audience, you may have been able to figure out who it is. Probably the older members of the audience, or the Five Nights at Freddy's fans. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, everyone. Knows. Yeah, we all know who we're talking I about. <laughs> don't want to drop the name yet just in case it ends up falling through because he is busy and we have been trying to get this together since before the strike started. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, 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 wow, we, 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 we invoked his name <laughs> and the spirits of the gaze he's played came out in full <laughs> That's, uh... <laughs> Do you need you need to wave your hands? No, uh, honestly, I if it honestly if it's if it's cool with you, I want to leave this in just because of how funny of a moment it is. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a little too just a, low. just a tad. <laughs> I mean, not as low as it was five seconds ago, but it's it's a little low. <laughs> I guess I'm just not allowed to say his name. Yeah. There you go. That's probably the best. It's probably for the best. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, it's, it's gone completely loose. Technical difficulties, <laughs> folks. We're so glad we're not doing this. Live. <laughs> oh, if we were doing this live, it'd be so much more hilarious. <laughs> No, this is the reason I don't join live. But that's not. valid. That's you valid. To do anything live ever. I like, mean, you don't have to have a webcam to, to to draw live. You could have like the the PNG tubing thing or whatnot, to where you can have something that represents you. 
Will people notice the slight camera angle shift? I, I mean, again, I'm leaving the part where the camera fell, so if they don't realize why the camera's a little shifted, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> but... <laughs> Re re <laughs> regardless funny moment aside like the fact that you're able to 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 get such an impressive cast on on such a unique project like it like especially seeing like how this project has developed from web from web comic to an incredible like indie animated thing that you animate by yourself with an impressive cast in one way or another even with the little bit of help you have with with such incredible music and the people you had on board and then seeing the people especially in the indie animation community really rallying behind you and seeing this thing come to fruition it has to amaze you how far swift spark has come along right Definitely, it's certainly in a span of a year, and I mean, of course, you can always compare yourself to bigger people, and if you're going to do that, you're always going to end up comparing yourself to someone, and that's going to get really tiring and demotivating, so that's also something I would recommend to other indie animators, whether they're already working or aspiring, just don't compare yourself to others, and just look at where you started, mm -hmm where I started last year and look where you are, mm -hmm. where I am now. So just completely you know, not looking at what others are doing and just look at yourself and what you've achieved. And then you're going to see that you've achieved more than you, you think. Oh yeah. And especially in the case of Vincent and David, like they've been so kind and so it's so incredible to work with. I, I've said it multiple times, but especially like they're so incredibly kind, and they they've really honored the spirit of the characters they played when I was a kid, and first getting to to know them, so to say, the, as Phineas and Ferb. Of course, David only recently joined the cast during the Milo Murphy's Law era, but. To me, he's it's like he's always been firm. Right. And it's it's really just the, the follow your dreams no matter who you are, how old you are. Just you know I mean that's that you know, the the thing in Phineas and Ferb, like, aren't you a little young to be doing this or that? And like, yeah, I am. And and just nobody questions it and that is the the spirit that I really felt Vincent and David brought along to this project. Like, here is some 21 year old back then but now 22 but 21 year old absolute nobody i've never heard of and they they want me to play in their cartoon sure why not yeah <laughs> it's just like you know it's it's it's, it's weird how life it, it's also inspired me to just you know like put my big boy pants on and just go after someone who's who's like you know he Speaking of online clout, you know, he he could fucking step on me and I disappear to the dust. Like, this guy probably can't even see me from, like, up there yeah. where he's at <laughs> in terms of, like, he, he's he's got this huge career. And if, if he's, like, looking down at me and like, yeah, I'll join you. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> so that's that's one thing what I am... A little afraid of in terms of that because I want to work with him because he's awesome and I love his videos and I love everything he's done so far so much so that I actually wrote a character that is inspired by one of his characters and that's why I want him okay. to play it like it's, it's it's literally like if he says no the episode's off okay so it's, it's really an homage to me being a fan of him and then getting to work together on like a project and the one thing i'm afraid of like all he has to do is like retweet me once and jesus take the wheel <laughs> and i'm never logging <laughs> onto my twitter again i swear <laughs> to god like like i'm i'd be happy to because his fandom like i've been in the fandom actively i was on his Discord server until it became members only. I'm considering becoming a member so I can get back in. And I, I've, I was in there, and it was there was has never been like all these fandoms you see. There's always somebody toxic, somebody stirring the pot, somebody being annoying, and sometimes it's it's bigger 
percentages of the audience than in other audiences. Mm -hmm. But mm. it's it's never happened to me there. So I, I'd be happy to, but I'm also just scared of the sheer number. I mean, so may maybe we're going to we're going to keep it quiet until the episode <laughs> comes out and then his, his name just scrolls across the screen and that's it. <laughs> you guys figure it out in your hero. You'll find it. I, I know you will. Well, I, I, I mean, to be f fair, this this person that we are very obviously hinting at, I mean, he's done a really good job kind of like really cultivating a, a good mentality when it comes to that community. I imagine that kind of community is something that you want to reiterate back into your own with kind of the, the message that you have with Swift Spark. And yes, the, absolutely. Yeah, and the uh, the incredible stories that you have both like what you've have presented and for what's to come. And I'm genuinely curious for people that may be curious if they have been keeping up at this point with Swiss Parker, maybe they're looking to get into it. Like just out of curiosity, what should the people expect when it comes to the future of Swift Spark? Of course, right now I'm, I'm kind of like, this is, uh, I intend to move out in, 2025 at the latest right now I'm, I'm living like easy life 22 pays like 200 bucks a month okay for his expenses like you you can't have it any easier <laughs> than i do right now so in 2025 that's going to change so 2024 is kind of the make or break it year for swiss park so i'm i'm considering either doing a full episode like with what i'm making right now and the savings i got to collect past year i'm I can do almost a full episode and then crowdfund for a little bit of it. Or I could put all of that in pre-production. And pre-production is, is a term some of my followers on Twitter ended up finding a little confusing. But Twitter also allows you to, like, five characters in a tweet. Like, we're texting in 2005 <laughs> and it's 50 cents per text. But... Pre-production is for those who don't know is is just storyboards and voice acting like and and that's a cutoff point like there's more stuff before that but it, it stops at the voice acting so to say mm -hmm. mostly and so I could do the same amount of money for pre-production so storyboards voice acting for three episodes and then crowdfund a little bit that same little bit for a fourth so then we'd have five episodes storyboarded like animatics that I could upload and use to promote or I could have one more episode before things drastically slow down and maybe if I can use this year wisely enough to actually keep that you know to grow it to a point where it becomes more sustainable on its own maybe that can continue going but that's that's the most important thing I would say right off the bat. Like, we're going to get either five, including the pilot, but then, of course, four new episodes storyboarded mm -hmm. this year, or one full episode, and then things are going to slow down because I'm self-funding the whole right. thing. So that is the most important takeaway. Like, things... It's it's not hell of a boss. It's, it's not... Like hell of a boss in terms of indie animation has been incredible with the output and even there there have been complaints that it's slow like two seasons in four years but you, you gotta imagine like it, it's still it's it's an insanely big indie mm -hmm. budget in terms of budget but it's still an indie budget and i'm um, well below that <laughs> you so are literally going to be one slow. person with a voice acting cast that is it <laughs> right now yeah though i i hope to get a crew for this next chapter of swiss park together and we'll see how much we can do together before my money runs out right. essentially right but aside from that, once you can look past that, I do hope to ultimately get to make the whole series, of course. And looking at the future, it would be three seasons and about, in total, about 75 episodes, ideally. Okay. But that's in a perfect world. And it's basically just the first season is James getting to know him. It's, it's like his, in the pilot, we essentially see him after summer, his first summer as the Swiss Spark. And 
at the end of the pilot, we're gonna go back to the start of the summer. It's, it's not really a big spoiler, in my opinion. We're gonna go back to the start of the summer, and that's where season one is gonna go. Like, we're just gonna see him struggle with his powers the first few times, the first few fights, and his friends have to back him up, and he, he just needs to find his feet and realize, like, hey, these guys are here to help me. I don't have to do it all on my own. Hence the, oh, fuck, when I saw Kid Conflict. <laughs> it's like, s- same, same thing. Okay, great. This is, this is going great. This is why I don't watch other things anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then season two gets into his final year in high school where things get a little bit more serious like the first season is kind of episodic happy-go-lucky like goof- goofier villains and and like hinting at the overarching arcing overarching story mm-hmm. and then season two really gets into that story and season three that's where the adult like it, it's kind of a teenage show because I feel like teenagers always get the shortest stick. Adults too, because either it's a family guy clone or hell of a boss at this point. So that's kind of you know, disappointing in terms of what adult animation really right. gets. But that's more of a an issue with the the big industry more so than indie animation because indie animation has some really creative shows geared towards adults but mine is a bit more towards teens because I don't really feel like I, I'm not against an F-bomb once or twice in an episode but I've now written two episodes where it doesn't happen once that third episode that we're planning with that that, that you know that guy will probably because the, the character I, I'm like inspired by for the story <laughs> says a lot a lot of these words. We gotta let it slip once or twice for a special occasion, you know? (laughs) You can't you can't write a W stash episode without him saying right. fuck if right. it's once. Right, right. Now you're demonetized. <laughs> oh, trust me. I, 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 hey, we're way past the first 30 seconds, so you can let all the fucks fly. <laughs> we're good. <laughs> But so it's it's like I'm I'm not against swearing, but it's, but I also believe that adult animation can be more than vulgar humor and, and this sort of thing. Like, you know, it's it's just more common in adult animation. But I also feel like it it can be a little too goofy, a little bit too silly for most adults to really consider it adult animation. So I was like, okay, fuck it, teenage teen teen there animation. It's it's for teens. <laughs> Because it's it's what I would have enjoyed at the ripe old age of fifteen, so it's it's teen animation. There you go. And and that's I guess sort of what to expect from the future of the show if it gets to go there. Three seasons, getting gradually less fun and goofy. Like like not like Gravity Falls where it's it's literal whiplash like <laughs> going from just fun summer hijinks to the final episode <laughs> like we're all gonna die I, <laughs> but it's, prob- it's it, it gets gradually I would say it's probably that. more closer to the Steven Universe model of like the first season just being this like fun yeah. you know kid trying to learn his powers or whatnot to realizing there's this whole entire world and society that he's to be more responsible and be a true adult about and yeah I, I, I could see the connection there yeah. see I made a connection to another piece of media to your show <laughs> 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 but it it really that is the the crux of it it's it's like james just starts off goofing off with his powers and oh look look at me being a superhero and getting his ass absolutely beat left right and center and his friends going we, we can't we this is this kid is going to end up on life support at some point and then as he really he gets older and he gets more in tune with his powers and he he starts to realize like oh crap maybe there's more to this superhero business than just having flashy powers and a fuck ugly suit and and maybe there there is something about what makes someone a hero and what makes someone deserve those powers and and with great power comes great responsibility. Uh, there it is there's the line what's uh, the <laughs> 
<laughs> the tone of the show <laughs> really goes along with the character's age because he ages two and a half years over the span of the okay. show and that's that's kind of like as he you know this matures the show also matures well there you go that that is the intent behind there it. you go and i mean speaking of like how you know mature how stuff grows over the years or whatnot like think about not just what you have planned in the future what you currently have what you've been able to present hell thinking all the way back to whenever you were young and first discovering stuff like phineas and ferb and really like honing in your skills as an artist thinking to your entire art journey as a whole does it amaze you how far you've been able to develop as an artist well especially when i don't know if i still can but for a good while back when it was the old design on DeviantArt, I couldn't visit my profile because then it would say deactivate it, but I could still find like the, the deviations I made on the band mm -hmm. accounts when searching my name. And when I, I, I have some of those downloaded and when I look at <laughs> what I made at age 11 compared to what I do now, I mean, sure, it may not be like... The, Again, there, there's people who have grown farther in in that same amount of time, mainly because when I was a kid, I wasn't really, like, practicing anatomy, and that, that really came when I was, like, 16, 17, and I got rejected from art school, and at age 20, I got rejected from art school again, so it completely didn't yeah, matter. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, oh, fuck, an anatomy? <laughs> like, I, I did have, like, these drawing books, like, drawing the human figure, but I, I never really went into, like, actually muscles and bones and, and, and just, you know, so it, it's, that's something I had to play catch right. up, catch right. up to. And so that's, that's also something I'm able to put into perspective. Like, these people actually had, like structure like a plan when they started and i was just a 10 year old with a tablet that cost 20 bucks at a grocery store fuck goofing off for a couple hours a day so when i i put that into perspective that the first five to six mm. years didn't really like I, I didn't really start to learn how to draw for those first six years when until I really started intentionally, like with intent, practicing anatomy and all, all those things like like you should have from the start because it's, it's really difficult to unlearn things you did wrong rather than to learn how to do them right from the beginning. Somebody's opening <laughs> like fluffy with four feet ah. open doors he's not supposed to be opening. But when I, I put it into perspective, like, this first five years, you were just goofing off and having fun without any real intent, then I'm like, yeah, like, if you put it into perspective, like, you did this in in half a decade, a little more than half a decade, then, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely impressed. It's definitely when I look at the... I, I don't want to say the name of the first one because I, I hate it, and the Star Wars animation that I made that both got over a million views. When I look at how god awful <laughs> those animations actually are. No, no, really. Like the, the first one, which we don't talk about because you also have merch with a trans flag. Yeah. So yep, we're, we're yep. both on the same page on that. I, I actually rendered it at the wrong frame rate. So oh. it has ghosts. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I animated it at 24 and I rendered it at 30. Mm, okay. So it, it, it has ghosting of, of the frames to, to catch up with the, the higher frame rate. And, and when you look at those sorts of things and, and now you just look at something that, you know, just might be on par with a really low budget animated series or at, at most a student film. Like, from someone who did go to art school and studied art for four years. I'm like, yeah, you, you did good yeah. for not having, actually having an art school. Because you don't have to go to art school, but I don't do notice, in my country at least, without a degree, they, the, most studios don't really take you seriously. Mm. Like, I was literally told by a studio two years ago, I believe, when I applied there for not an internship, but we have, like, this... 
uh, sometimes jobs like that offer like something akin to an apprenticeship. Okay. And I applied to that and I was, and she literally emailed me back and was like, from what I can see in your CV, perhaps you should consider going to school first. And I heard that and I was Damn. like, Damn. All, all the YouTubers telling me, you don't need to go to art school. We're lying. But it, art school does make, make getting jobs in certain situations like mine, especially when you want to get a job that requires a visa yep. easier. Yep. But the things you learn in art school, you can learn those online if you know where to find them. And you have to discipline mm-hmm. to keep up with it yourself. Like, I live in a country where going to college is super cheap like the school itself costs two and a half k per year so four years that's it's a a little under 10k then if my math is correct whereas you don't even get like one year of school and for that in the u.s it's it's, it's like perspective of course yeah Yeah. it's it's very different but i mean yeah but (laughs) For someone who didn't go to art school, who had to find those resources himself, who had to have the discipline to... And of course, in art school, you still actually need to put yourself towards making, doing your homework. Because if you're not going to... You get out of art school what you put into it, essentially. But the the financial is is kind of like the extra extra push that you might need. (laughs) But I had to do it completely myself and in in terms of what i've achieved in relatively a short time span still i'm i'm satisfied with what i put down especially thinking back of course again like i i did it myself like it's that that's the most important thing i'll always take away from it is like i didn't have anyone to tell me what to do or to guide me through it I just I went and I googled and I did it wrong a lot because that that teaser that we talked about at the beginning that I did for the first time in 2020 I reanimated it like the rough animated version I didn't finish it but I rough animated it again in 2021 and then I did it again in 2022 Mm. So it, it's a lot of lot of trial right. and error, but it's it's worth it to me. Like, you know, you, you find yourself at dead ends and turning back around and trying a different path a lot. But it's it, that's also part of the journey. Like you, you find out things that don't work and and you find things that do work and then you find a shortcut and And sometimes you find that shortcut actually was the long way around. And so it's it's, it's really just a a little game that you're playing with yourself and it's frustrating. And and you you need to have like the motivation and the discipline to keep going because it is tough. And sometimes things don't go your way. Like my plan was really naive, (laughs) was 16 year old. I graduated just a a month before turning 17 from high school and my plan was art school internship job didn't go exactly according to plan nobody gets but nowadays i also learned that hardly anyone gets art school internship job for most people it's art school internship lots of applying and hearing nothing back and then job eventually and sometimes even never job but finding other ways to still be artistic and that's why i'm i ended up not getting the storyboard or character design job i wanted but i do get to work occasionally on other indie shows and I, i just freelance a couple pages of storyboards and i now have an apprenticeship with john fountain and it it's that's unpaid but it's it's still a good a lot of experience with someone who's worked in animation yeah. and it's it's just you know finding just finding your own way to do it and and that that all again stems back to i i, I really hate like it, it sounds so fake like how can this 
cartoon have so much effect on your life like you're just you're faking <laughs> it like it, it's not real but really like going back Phineas and Ferb was like literally my lifeline to keep going as a kid and just that I, I really 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 took that to heart like the the carpe diem the find your own way to make the most of it absolutely I mean and you're going to be sitting around and and waiting and waiting and and the, the kickstarter didn't succeed and this didn't go right and that and I'm not good enough I can't animate well enough to, to make a whole episode by myself I can't do this and who the fuck cares <laughs> just go do it and you know it's just like like I I mean I, I sat there agonizing like I my animation isn't TV quality who the hell is going to watch it if it's not TV quality and sure I, I've had comments like recently I, I got one of those comments on Twitter and I ended up just calling it out and it ended up getting 2,000 <laughs> likes in, in my support. So I, I know there's people out there who agree with me. Like The, the comment was literally like, yeah, this, this is a little, little amateuristic compared to what we've seen in indie animation. And I don't know if this person, because they ended up deleting their comment the second <laughs> I called them out on it, but... Like, I don't know if this person didn't realize that I didn't have a team or, you know, that that was just the assumption because what we've seen recently in animation of has been lackadaisy and bigger productions of that, like that. I I can't compete yeah. with that because I, I'm not that. I, I don't have the budget. I don't have the team. So I, I know better than to compare myself to it. So... And, and that's taken me a lot of time to like a few months ago it, I was really kind of put in my own place by myself because I I I read an interview with Vizzy Pop I think for Hasman Hotel and it, it stated that she was in her 30s and I was like wait a minute so I I I admit I ended up looking up the ages of other like big players in, in the animation and it was 30 40 yeah. and I was like I'm I I'm just I just barely turned 20 yeah. like I'm 22 and it's just like I'm I of course I'm not on their level yet like, so that's that's something I can go back to whenever I get frustrated that maybe my career isn't going as fast as it may seem to be going for others but she's 32 if I'm not mistaken I'm 22. It took her years to build that career with Die Young and Has Been and Hell of a... I'm at the start yep. of that. And technically, maybe... I mean, of course, I'm not certain because I wasn't really there back when that person started growing. But there is someone else out there the the author of the Phineas and Ferb fan fiction that I was there when she was my age because ten years ago, give or take, I met her. She was my the age I okay. am now. So I get to look back at that and like, yeah, you are about you know I feel like I am about where they were where she was when she was my age, so. It, it's you know, it may seem slow going but it's going those people are 10 20 years older than me i'm i'm at the start of where they right. are now and if i just keep going if i don't like hmm, i'm not at their level never mind it's never gonna happen like if you don't give your yourself that time to get there you're, you're not going to get there so just if you keep going and Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I won't get there. I don't know. I, I can't tell the future. And if I could, I probably would be killing some kids in in a room because my wife is going to die. <laughs> but <laughs> that, that's, oh, somebody's going to. <laughs> How do you know I'm not the one that's going to clip that uh, content? No. Um, 
<laughs> I, maybe you will. But, you know, I can't tell the future. Maybe, maybe I will get there. Maybe I won't. But I'll never get there if I don't exactly. try. And there's already been some pretty amazing people that have looked my way and been like, yeah, I, I think this, this, this isn't entirely a hopeless endeavor. <laughs> So it's, it's it's like you know the more it, I believe is is the song with I I first heard it at, from the video of Jim Han Jim Henson's funeral but I believe it's from Snoopy if just one person believes in you and then more and more and when all those people believe in you maybe even you can believe in you too it's like you know there you go that that's that's kind of that's my whole philosophy like that the Phineas and Ferb is just kind of around the center and that's that's why I I just always advocate like people making fun of like people adults who like Bluey no oh. oh I I experience how important that is that like the how important it is especially when you're growing up to have something around you that imposes that positive kind of mentality in you to keep going and to believe in yourself and to just general positivity because Phineas and Ferb was that for me that that just that positive message that really got grained into my skull <laughs> that you know and there's also this Dutch idiom that roughly translated is just a person who dares to try owns half the world a brutal mens heeft the whole world. And it, it's also like, you miss 100% of the shots you yep. don't take. And I, so far, I took a shot, and it yeah. landed. And will my next shot land? I don't know. But if I don't take it? Yeah. I mean, more than anything else, like, kind of going a, a little bit to the point where you're talking about, of, you know, talking about these different creators and, like, how far they've been developed. Progress is never fully linear. Like, there's, it, it has, it's, it's you know highs and lows more than anything else but the fact that you have a lot of love and passion for this project the fact that you're going out there and doing what you can on your own to bring this vision to life the fact that you're willing to take those shots that you're talking about believe me when i say that there are several people out there myself included that love and admire what you're doing and definitely want to see you succeed more than anything else um i mean i know i'll definitely I of course that. absolutely but for this next question, if I may, let's take a, a one of the biggest shots, if I may, and give you more or less the dream scenario. Let's say I am Big Shot Mr. Moneybags. I come up to you and I'm like, look, Pan, we've seen what you've been able to produce, and we believe there's some potential here. You just need that little extra boost, a little extra platform to get you to that point. We, we, we know it's possible. We're just here to offer a little help. We have access to anyone and everyone in whatever industry possible, and more money than there should be possible. We really should be compensating the animators that work hard on this stuff. We'll take care of them shortly. Right now, we are focusing on you and you alone. If given this opportunity, what would be the dream fantastic project? Of course, Swift mm -hmm. Spark would be... But also, just like... If Dave Filoni called me and told me, you have to drop everything you're doing right now, but I want you on Star Wars yep. or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I'd fly to LA There tomorrow. you go. I just, absolutely. And of course, like, Phineas and Ferb is still something that... If Dan and Swampy call me, like, I am hesitant about moving to California for anything at this point. Because, uh, America is not exactly the safest place for trans. <gasps> yeah, anymore. not, not necessarily. It's definitely, I have plans to, well, fuck it. I'm just going to go to the cheapest Californian art school <laughs> I can find. And I'm, I'm just going to have a grand old time there and, and do what I can to get a re decently priced degree because I kept hearing from people like, oh, oh, American art schools would definitely admit you. And so I was like, why not give it a shot at, at like uh, Cal State Fullerton is where I wanted mm. to go. 
but I ended up putting those plans on hold. And as a result, I'm, I'm also hesitant to move to California for any job. But if Dan and Swampy emailed me tomorrow and were like, hey, so uh, the Disney casting department, like the hiring, we think they're stupid and they made a mistake and we want to hire you, but you have to be on site, then yeah, I, I would move. I I would move to California just for to work on Phineas and Ferb and Star Wars. <laughs> like, if that... Because Dave, a few years ago, they were talking about an animated Star Wars Rebel Ooh. sequel that more or less morphed into Ahsoka. But if they said, like, hey, Ahsoka went well, but we want to go back to doing something animated, like Tales of the Jedi Season 2, which is currently in production, if, if they call and it's like, we want you in Tales of the Jedi... There you go. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you said you said you're hesitant to move out there so, for just yeah. any project, but Star Wars and Phineas and Ferb—they're not just any projects. They're obviously projects that are near and dear to your no, heart. Definitely. I mean, like you know, getting up to you to work on that, or hey, maybe even developing a studio for you so you can really go forth and truly bring Swift Spark to its fullest you know, potential. Maybe use some of the fundings to help some of the other projects that you may have had a hand in, such as the incredible Defenders of uh, uh, Aladia. Uh, you know, just just little stuff here and there to help really bring stuff like that to reality. I mean, I think Mr. Moneybags can be more than happy to compensate for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Absolutely. But sadly, we gotta get down from the dream scenario. We gotta get back to reality, and I'll ask the ever-so-generic question. Where do you hope to see yourself in, say, five to ten years? Well, five to ten years, like, I, uh, about a year or a year and a half ago, Vincent and I, like, joked, like, Vincent wanted to get, get on another project that made it to a panel at San Diego Comic-Con, oh. and I was like, you know, I hope we get to work on it together, and it's like, any... You know, any project with you in it is already San Diego Comic Con worthy. So, <laughs> I do hope that Swiss Spark gets the full three seasons. You know, like the fully funded seasons that I would ideally like it. Mm -hmm. You know, indie animation is growing. I I don't know where it's going just yet, for me at least. And as a whole, I also don't know if it's like it, it's growing and it's going to collapse. I don't think so, but. You know, it could, but I don't think it's gonna. And I all I, I can only hope that Swiss Park gets to enjoy and you know, partake in that growth and that our mystery, totally not pink mustached <laughs> Prince Charming decides, you know what, I, I can see the fun of this and I'm going to uh, join in. He can find a tiny hole for me in his in this massively busy schedule. He's, he he really is busy. I I can imagine. But if he if he's if he says no because he's too busy, then I got yeah that. yeah you you are busy. Yeah no that's that's very valid. But I'm sure hopefully he can find the time to to peer in and give a little hello. But you know that's only a matter of time. You know. <laughs> <laughs> As we start to oh. I I did send. I did send along a storyboard that so you can sort of see like wh what would your character be like. Mm. So let's hope that that helps. But yeah, definitely like dream, like dream five years. I would just indeed uh, not only have Swiss Park well on its way in maybe its second or third season, but also get to do something similar to like glitch or Ooh. i believe bended mill is also trying yes. to be a studio that wants to help other indie but they're just focusing on box down right, right now until they they kind of get the size that they would need to take on other projects but i would love to have a studio like that and and then that doesn't rely on buying IP because that that is the horror that's been occurring in all of entertainment right now is just IPs like Warner Brothers is even attacking Looney Tunes yeah. like one of its core IPs isn't safe 
Like, imagine if if Disney just decided to get rid of all the Mickey Mouse shirts on Disney Plus. Like, it's, it's, it's insane. It's literally your mascot. What the fuck are you doing? So it's, it's like I, IP being owned by, let's just say the AMPTP, because that that the, the, those guys are the problem here. That that can't that really went into Kermit the Frog territory <laughs> in, in my ears. But <laughs> <laughs> those guys are the problem here. <laughs> Fair, I mean, yeah. but studios that couldn't give less of a shit of about the creatives and their babies and, and just takes those babies and, and, and yeets them into the trash like Andy in Woody's Nightmare. Like, I don't want to play with you anymore. <laughs> like, you don't make me enough money anymore. Like, that that is the, the nightmare that also has kind of, like, put me on a, like, do I want to pitch this? Like, do I want to hand this over to the evil mega corporation? Watch it get torn to shreds and become something completely different from what I wanted it to be maybe because I sold the project and if I say no to too many things I'm going to be branded as difficult to work with and it's going to get cancelled before it even gets out there or do I want to keep struggling on like you know peanut butter sandwiches and, and die on the Walmart floor in the so ever so eloquent words of Caleb Hammer, financial audit. I I love that show. And and just keep keep trying to, to like at at this rate that I'm doing right now, produce one episode a year for the next fifty years, and then then <laughs> die fifty episodes in when I'm seventy. It's, it's, it's like I know it's it's not sustainable, but I. I feel like I do need to give it a shot. Like, if now I'm like, okay, this one episode took me a year to make, took too long, I'm going to stop, then, yeah, of course, like, not everyone gets a, a pilot episode that gets millions of views. Like, again, those those people that did had audiences eons bigger than mine when they put out the pilot right. like my my show is growing alongside the pilot mm -hmm. if i'm not going to allow it that time to grow and i know it's it's difficult because it's really really expensive and i'm probably going to run out of money before it becomes sustainable and if that happens then i gave it my best shot and then i'll i'll have to find another way even if that means taking a break to, you know, to maybe find an investor or someone who can help me. And that, that is like, ideally I would want to be that person for someone yes. else to be able to help them. Like, and I'm not going to take your creation and rip it to pieces and then hand like this tiny piece back to you. And like, this is what I want it to be. And if it's not that, and it, it, the one episode that you get to make doesn't immediately get 10 million views in the first five minutes, I'm going to cancel it, and you're never going to see it again, because it's mine, and, and you gave it away to me, and I can do with it whatever I want. That's that's what I ideally would, would want to be able to provide to other creators. Like right. That studio, but then... I wouldn't necessarily want to start off with whole shows, but like creators who, who come in and, and kind of, kind of what Frederator used to do with Cartoon Hangover, just have them make like a shorter version, like a short based on, and then not a 15 minute short, no, two, three minutes of like one really important aspect of her show, like the main character, the, the main character dynamic or maybe they have a world to show on. like what can you show us in maybe one maybe two two minute shorts like three minute shorts like and it does the audience find that interesting or is is there is there an audience for your idea and, and of course like you, you can't help everyone so then if I were to give them like $10,000 for the short and they would maybe have to come up with the rest of it themselves or just make do with those 10000 it's it's not a lot of money, but it's more than nothing. Yeah. You can do something like 
like at least give them the money to do to do something really small and then see if that garners an audience and and then of course like isn't that just you know what pitching is like they make a pilot and, and if the pilot isn't getting good feedback it, it doesn't get picked up you do need to draw a line of, of sorts like you, you can't just because money isn't infinite no matter who you are you don't have infinite money you have to draw up criteria at some point but i do feel like with shorts rather than full-on pilots you could help a lot more creators make at least something like one little thing and and give them at least a shot at getting seen than if you were to develop a pilot based on a whole show because like studio pilot development is a lot more expensive than what we in the indie space do. absolutely and even for us it's already really expensive but you know just if you can help one creator with a pilot or 20 creators with shorts you might end up with five creators who have a concept that really resonates with an audience or one oh people didn't actually find it that interesting so you passed on all those other ideas for this one that you thought was going to be great you know, so that that would be my thing i i would ask people to come with their shorts and then from based on those shorts like your short was super successful we're going to give you a pilot you know like from two minutes to 10 minutes in those 10 minutes we can build it out into a full show maybe you want to have a 20 minute show you have want to have a show that varies from like like the streaming like i'm i don't necessarily believe into holding on to the the 20 minute the 40 minute the 11 minute because that's based on you know commercial right, it, right it's got to fit between commercial blocks streaming online you can make it as long or as short as you can afford or as your story needs to be so you you want to have you know three three 10 minute episodes and three 15 minute episodes we can do that but then you know build it out from a short maybe a series of shorts to a pilot to however long you want the full thing to be exactly exactly if there's any sort of way you could do that that, that would be ideal right <laughs> yeah that's what i would do if i were like for example the size of glitch yep who I mean, I, I can't exactly judge how big they are or, and I was like, I'm going to start like this, this studio type thing where I let other creators pitch. Like, I don't know if they are letting creators, like, I'm, I'm not ent entirely certain of what the idea exactly is that they're trying with, with the glitch community, but Bandit Mill was, and John Fountain are more clear on that they want to do the whole pilot route you know, like the letting indie creators pitch their pilots but i would go okay we're, i'm going to help more creators create smaller things and then hopefully also end up taking more of those creators with me to something bigger oh there you go but i also understand it takes at that point it's going to take millions of dollars probably it's not easy. <laughs> so that's 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 not where I am right now, but that's something I would dream about for the future. Hey, anything can happen in five to ten years. We don't know at this point. Um, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, the, the fluffy thing is making a mess in the corner. Ooh. It's, it's, uh... His name is... Can, can you guess what his name is? Because when we first got him home, the first thing he did was disappear for 30 minutes. Mm. So is it like ghosty or something like that? <laughs> I stood in the room. We couldn't find him. Well, I first realized he was gone and I couldn't find him. So I just said, hey, where's Perry? <laughs> I I should have guessed. I should have guessed. So we named him. Jesus. 
Like we were we were on the way home in the car with him, and at first we were like Stitch was one of the contenders or Chewy, <laughs> or something like that. And and we got home, and and he disappeared. He crawled under like we used to have an an open like old newspaper, you know, like old paper waste to recycle later on outside. And it used to be open, but then with a blanket cover. So if a slight gust of draft or something, it wouldn't go everywhere in the house. Mm -hmm. Now it's just with a closed lid. And he had crawled underneath that blanket. And I, I didn't see him anywhere. And I just, this, this, is this, 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 it's, it's the, this moment. the moment. I have to do it. Where's Perry? <laughs> and it's done. There you go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, <laughs> and, you know he he honors his name he <laughs> honors his name because he doesn't do much oh there you go <laughs> like, literally the laziest the laziest cat <laughs> in the world he <sighs> sleeps literally all day that you so, know of yeah because how often do you pay attention to him all day mm. <laughs> well he, he usually sleeps on the bed oh uh, okay okay so fair enough fair enough sleeps, yeah. anyways but <laughs> As we start to wind down the interview, I just have one last question I want to ask you, Pam. Obviously, you're deeply invested in art in one way or another. How important is art, not just for you, but for the world as a whole? Very important. And that's also something that's got me really concerned because the majority, like the vast majority of my country voted for a guy was not only really right wing mm -hmm. and just racist, but also really anti art. And this may insult some people, but you know, the the guys uh, in history that banned art were usually the bad guys. <laughs> yeah, and they banned art because they were too stupid to understand the meaning behind art, and they were worried they were being made fun of in the art so they only allowed certain types of art to be made in their respective dictatorships because they could understand exactly what it meant only literal art that actually the thing represented in the art was also the thing pictured in the art no no stories or hidden meanings allowed mm -hmm. and then then you know i'm of the opinion like if of course, not every type of art is going to be your thing. Like, modern art with, like, it's a line on a white canvas. It's like, I, I can get that that's not your thing. But art is a lot more than that modern art museum that you walked out of scratching your head. Like, why did I pay money to see this? Right. And some people love that mo same modern art that you don't care for. But art is is music, art is video games, even though people may disagree. I think there's a lot of art and design work goes into video games and even to a degree coding. Yeah. Like every coder, like experienced coders have a very niche way of coding. Like of course the base is the same, but it's the same with art, like the anatomy or it, it, the same colors, but every artist has their own style and their own bit of flavor same goes with coding and some people just use if else everywhere for every line and then their game runs at like five fps even on the heaviest of graphics cards and then they spend 10 years developing said game <laughs> 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 but yeah it's it's even cooking like oh yeah what some some people may not consider the microwave meal that they make when they're home from work and they're tired and they can't be bothered because they just spend 16 hours at work and two hours commuting and I just want something to eat. But Gordon Ramsay, for example, if you were to ask him, he'd probably consider what he does. Yeah. Art. And musicians are art. And there's there, Art is so much more than just what you may think is art. And, and that's why I think it's terrifying that this guy wants to defund art institutions like museums and art classes in like primary schools and secondary schools and art school college. Like he, he, he doesn't understand the value. Like 
and, and like I know that with AI art you see how there's a lot of people who just like as long as picture move me no care mm. you know and it's like yeah I know there's a lot of those people out there but you know those AI algorithms still yeah even if you think they can take over from us now they were made with our work yeah. so without us first being here your shitty algorithm would have had nothing your algorithm is nothing without us and we're going to fuck up your algorithms by glazing our art and putting everything we can into our metadata that you can't see but your little robot friend can and he's going to think that my blue bird is a purple elephant yep and then it's going to be useless for you to use so you know artists can and will fight back and even if our unions will not protect us we will protect ourselves there you go. There you go. That is wonderfully worded, if I do say so myself. Um, Pan, that is all the questions. Maybe a little longer. <laughs> is, <laughs> That's just me. I warned you at the start of this interview, my parents actively made fun of me as a kid. That I, I'm a little... This, uh, this thing, this thing. <laughs> hey, the, doesn't hey count. this is a podcast. Long-winded is just par for the course around here. Um <laughs> That is all the questions that I have. You could say I'm distractible. <laughs> well, like I was saying, that is all the questions. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> that is all the questions that I have for you, Pan. Um, I've already showered you with a bunch of praise, but I want to shower you with a little bit more because it's my podcast. I do the f whatever the fuck I want. Um, <laughs> look, uh, ever since I first became aware of Swift Spark and what you've been able to do, I've been just impressed from like the word go. The fact that you've been able to to put this incredible story, unique characters, like really bring them to life in one way or another. Like it's been absolutely fascinating, especially realizing that it's just you being the one that's really doing the the bulk work of actually making these pictures move and bringing this vision to a visual medium more than anything else getting the chance to sit down, getting to talk with you, getting to really learn like just how much this truly does mean to you and how important it is for you to tell this story, especially with the people that you've been able to bring on board and really go forth and tell such a fantastic story. Like hearing how much of a basic dream come true it is ever since you've really gone forth and done this. Like I, I cannot help but do anything but root for you. Like it's, it's nothing short of impressive what you've been able to do so far. And I sincerely hope that you get an opportunity, whether by yourself or with a good crew or whoever you have behind you, to keep going forth and keep chasing those dreams, keep really bringing this stuff to reality, keep really taking command of your life and seizing the day, carpe dieing, DMing it to the fullest more than anything else because you, you absolutely deserve it. You've earned it, and I know you will continue to strive to do what's absolutely incredible. Thank you for putting yourself out there. Thank you for the incredible work that you do. And please, please, please keep up the incredible work because you got a growing fan base right now. And it's definitely grown a lot more today thanks to you know yours truly. I'm definitely going to be by your side rooting for you every single opportunity that I can get. Thank you for keeping up the awesome work. Thank you. And thank you for having me on your podcast. It's been a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun talking here just... About anything. I believe we mostly talked about Phineas and Ferb, but there was some, <laughs> some talk about Swiss Spark somewhere. It, in it was either Phineas and Ferb or Swiss Spark. And either way, like that's a good, full, fulfilling conversation on its own. All right. I think we had a good chat. <laughs> and that's that's where my philosophy just comes from. Like, if, if you want to know how are you so optimistic, just watch a little show named Phineas and Ferb, and you know why I am an insufferable <laughs> optimist well, and uh, why I've been able to do the things I did. Well, if people want to see more of the things you have done and what you have to come, go ahead and plug yourself for the people at home. My name is Pantastique. You can find me on pretty much every platform with some variation with either a 
a hyphen is what it's called, yep. I think, just a tall dash or a lower yep. dash underscore. Yep. And I'm on Twitter, YouTube, Blue Sky, pretty much every platform. I don't use them all that often, but I am on there. So just take your pick and you'll see if I'm alive or dead on there. And if you are really, 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 really hyped about Swiss Spark, you may have seen me drink from this glass all episode. It's available on my fourth wall shop, which is shop.swift-spark.com for convenience. And it's not the only thing. We've got notebooks, hoodies, blankets, though it's blurk. You can't see it. <laughs> I'm sitting on a pillow. We've got everything. And it's going to help us produce more episodes. Everything you buy goes directly back into the episodes because fourth wall handles all of the items for us so it doesn't cost us yeah. anything. no trust me as someone that uses fourth wall for his own merch shop i mean yeah <laughs> they are amazing. they really are i i really they are the most creator folks like this is going to turn into a sponsored moment for fourth wall but they are the most creator focused print on demand merch service like I've never had a team reply that fast and be that dedicated. They are awesome. And we can both attest to that their items. The hoodies are soft. Oh, and yes. The blanket is huge. <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing. It's awesome. And they actually offer very unique items, such as keep an eye on my Twitter for something big, soft, and cuddly coming out very very soon Ooh. probably right alongside our next crowdfunding which is either going to be for pre-production of our next four episodes or for the production of one episode but i have a feeling we're going to be leaning towards the four episodes because that includes a special announcement mm. that we hope to be able to make very soon well, uh, here here's the hope and <laughs> Last, last but not least, if you're not interested in merch, you can always just pledge to the Patreon or make a single donation to Ko-Fi. That's also very appreciated because the Patreon behind the scenes stuff is only accessible on there. And if you really want to, just a few days early now at this point, but you can still watch the pilot a couple days early only on Patreon. There you go. That's a wonderful, wonderful plug. Seriously, support Pan wherever you can. Which, also, I forgot to ask this just a little bit sooner, but one last question before we sign off. Your name, Pantastic. How did you come up with that name, Pantastic? Well, my best friend, the the one I met because of Finney is in Furb on DeviantArt, yes. (laughs) It never stops. She can't, they came up with... The, the nickname Peter Pan mm. and also because I, I was really into like studying French at the time and I can speak a little bit je parlais un petit peu de français mais ce n'est pas trop oh, pas tout français <laughs> ah oui oui <laughs> un petit peu <laughs> and I was really into French and Peter Pan and the, the nickname and Pan is also Greek for everything uh, so it's, it's a little bit self-indulgent but Pan fantastic fantastic mm. everything I make is fantastic oh there you go do you have any final words before we sign <laughs> <laughs> do you have any final words before we sign off I just wanted to say thank you for having me and be part of this wonderful lineup of guests mm-hmm. in the in the animation sphere you've been having these past few months. Oh, yeah. And if you want to have a great time with a good podcast, you should consider hitting our friend up here to get your own spot. <laughs> Just don't pester him. And don't be cryptic about asking, <laughs> when does your podcast record? I will. I will say uh, just to make sure you can fit it in. Your I was gonna say. I, I. I will say to people out there, I. If you do approach me, I appreciate it, but that does not guarantee you will be on the podcast. Okay, I will appreciate it. I will. I will 
gladly, you know, keep up a good conversation, but that does not guarantee you will be on the podcast. That's all I'm going to say. But I, but you can let them know you exist. Yeah, exactly. There you go. That you never know what that definitely happen. helps me out more than anything else. And I will say, Pan, you don't have to flatter me. You've already you already made it on the podcast. We're at the end of the episode. You, you're you're. <laughs> but I do appreciate the kind words. Thank you very much. Of course, anyone who is willing to help out members of the Inimad, the indie animation community. Big, small, just everyone out there because you've had someone massive like Sir Pelo, mm -hmm. you've had someone tiny like me. <laughs> you, know, you do them all. <laughs> well, there you go. I I appreciate that. Just everyone who's been so kind to us these past few months to help us, you know, get indie animation out there, especially with animation as a whole being just fucked over yep, because. Yep, yep. Voice actors aren't protected at all by this new deal, and it just sucks yeah. so much. I hate, I hate this deal. But I'm not SAG after, so I, I don't get to right to really have an opinion. I guess I get to have an opinion, but I, I don't get to really like talk over voice actors or actors who. who yeah. yeah, that's their job. Yeah. But, you know, any everyone who's who's come together, audience or you, like, with a podcast or other types of creators, video essayists who have been helping us out, promoting us, it, it's just, it's awesome that you guys have really banded together behind us when we've been fucked over left, right, and center just by every side of the industry. It's, it's awesome, and I appreciate it. And I just want to make sure that you guys know that we appreciate you as much as you guys appreciate of us. Of course, of course. Trust me, I, I the love, the the love is very mutual for both of us. I appreciate everything that you guys put forth, and I appreciate all the love and passion you put into it. Just as I know you guys appreciate what little I can bring forth, as long as it shows showcases what you guys are able to do. But definitely, with that. All I have to let to say is for the people at home, if you can, pay your artists. We definitely could use it. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. If this is your first time listening, I greatly do appreciate it. Uh, getting the chance to sit down and talk with Pan was a really fun opportunity, more than anything else. Um, Pan, if you've gotten up to this point, I, I know I said it a million times, but I'll say it again. Thank you so much for reaching out, and thank you so much for really providing a fun conversation for the people to see. Um, I sincerely am hoping nothing but the best for Swift Spark. Um, you're providing some incredible content that people need to see, especially with the way that you're going forth and doing it essentially by yourself. Um, I'm always going to be a person to champion this kind of stuff. I've been a person that champions this kind of stuff, you know? It's something that I guess I just kind of take a little bit of pride in, just knowing that I can help be a bit of a force to let people realize some of the incredible stuff that's out there if they don't know it already. Um, seriously, if you guys, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, go back, especially for the independent animation projects uh, playlist or whatnot, go through and listen to all the incredible people with all their incredible concepts. I mean, indie animation is truly something special right now, and every opportunity I get to be exposed to some new incredible creative idea it absolutely blows my mind you know i kind of said it in the episode itself but like sometimes it's hard for me to keep up with just how many incredible stuff that there is um i will also go ahead and say if you guys decide to reach out i appreciate it but that doesn't guarantee you'll get a spot on the podcast but the fact that i get to learn about 
such incredible creative ideas being pushed out there into the world. Like it, it truly warms my heart because I want to see more of that creativity. I want to see people going forth and really creating incredible, telling incredible stories, really putting their heart and soul into these fantastic characters, amazing worlds, wonderful plot points. Like I, I want to see all of that. And then some, that's why I'm going to be a person to champion it. That's why I've been championing uh, what my co-showrunner is doing, Tipsy J. Hart's with the evil little thing. And I will always champion that project until I blew in the face and six feet under. All right. <laughs> you know, several of the guests that I've had on here, you know, like Show 2Z with Tally Ho, Ashes Art with my purgatory friend, uh, Evan, a.k.a. Star Tease, with Lumi and the Great Big Galaxy. Dave and Ashley, when it comes to far fetch, Like, there are so many incredible projects and so much creativity out there that if you aren't already, you need to be championing it. You need to go out and try to find a way to support these people. Really let people know that you love what they're doing and you want to see more of it. Because any and all support that we can to let these people truly tell their stories to the fullest... I think it's totally worth it, and then so. Oh yeah, one last thing. Uh, part two of the Swift Spark and the Defense Five pilot is going to be premiering on Christmas Day. I better see you guys checking out that second part of the pilot, showing Pan a lot of love. He's put a lot of love and passion into this project, and it deserves to be rewarded by your viewership, liking, sharing, subscribing to Pan, all that stuff like that. Check out his YouTube in the link down in the description below. Make sure to share that love. Happy Holidays.